We're a footballing nation. Across all our leagues, right down to our grassroots. It's a game that binds us. Proud. United. Together. For you. For us. For all. But while we see and celebrate diversity on the pitch, there's still work to do to make for all mean for all. Signing up to the Football Leadership Diversity Code is a commitment by clubs to deliver football diversity to the highest standards. Clubs' leadership should reflect the diversity of the local community. Clubs should ensure diversity among their coaches and volunteers. And continue to strive for an inclusive club culture. Clubs should encourage the reporting of discrimination and raise awareness on the topic of equality, diversity and inclusion. Giving a fair chance to the best people. New ideas, fresh perspectives. Driving positive change through whole communities. Good for the game, good for clubs. A game for all. Sign up to the code today. Hello and welcome to the first of five Football Leadership Diversity Code sessions. Today is our opening session. We are here today speaking to you live from St George's Park, the home of the England football teams. And it is my pleasure to be here to provide an overview of the Football Leadership Diversity Code and its remit. You will have seen in the video just now that football is our national game. It's a game that binds us, but we need to make sure we do more to ensure this game is for all. We want to drive positive change through whole communities using the power of football. Good for the game and good for clubs. The Football Leadership Diversity Code, tailored for the National League system, women's pyramid and grassroots football, aims to tackle inequality and improve representation of diverse groups across senior leadership positions, wider team operations and coaching roles. Today's session is not an academic lecture. It is an awareness session to bring to life some of the key areas and topics that you need to know as you embark on your Football Leadership Diversity Code journey. This is what today's agenda looks like. We will be talking through the objectives of today. We'll walk you through the FA's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Strategy. We will then go into understanding what EDI actually means, looking at the Equality Act, protected characteristics, exploring biases and stereotypes, looking at an example of some case studies what it means to do role modelling, and then where you can get further support. In terms of an introduction, my name is Dal Daroch. I am the FA's Head of Diversity and Inclusion Strategic Programmes, and my colleague Aaron will do his introduction. Thanks for that, Dal. So my name is Aaron Williams. I'm the FA's Diversity and Inclusion Manager, and I've been here for just over six months now. So today's session objectives... There are really three things that we want to do. One is to train and educate you as stakeholders about EDI and the Football Leadership Diversity Code. So you understand exactly where we're coming from, what we're trying to do and how we're going to go about achieving it. We want you to develop awareness of protected characteristics. We want you to improve your understanding of EDI and really appreciate what we mean by difference. And we want you to understand some of the best practice that we're going to share with you today and for you to really understand what allyship in football is all about. So the FA strategy, many of you will have seen already the FA strategy, which is called A Time for Change. It was released in 2020 and it really focuses on the six key game changes that you can see in gold, in the gold background there, that we are trying to achieve across football as a whole. So we are wanting to unite the game and inspire the nation. We want to change the game to maximise its impact and we want to serve the game to deliver football for all. When we talk about changing the game and maximising its impact, you can see some of the key things there that we want to achieve as part of what we call our game changer objectives. Number one is to, to win a major tournament. We want our England teams to win a major tournament, uh, whether that's the Lionesses and the men's senior team and all of the other professional um, development squads that sit beneath our senior squads. We want to serve... 2 million plus players and, and the workforce through a transformed digital platform. We want to ensure equal opportunities for every girl to play at their school 
um, and club. We want to develop or, and deliver 7,000 quality pitches. And we also want to maximize the appeal and revenues of the FA Cups and the WSL. The game changer that you can see circled underpins everything we're trying to do, which is to use our influence as an FA, as a governing body, to deliver a game free from discrimination. That is an absolute key priority for us um, as, as the governing body of football in England. We want to make sure that we can deliver a game that's free from discrimination and do everything in our power to make that happen by enabling our stakeholders, the clubs, you know, the various organisations across the game to do everything that they need to do to also deliver a game that's free from discrimination. Underneath, you'll see a load of serve objectives. So things such as developing high performing workforce and cultures across football, across the FA, delivering world class venues and events, building a clear brand identity and strong reputation and being driven by technology and being insight driven. In terms of just looking a little bit further at a game free from discrimination, as you can see there, there are many different strategies that we have within the FA that are all leading into a time for change, into our overall FA strategy. You will have seen already the recent release of a game for all, which is our equality, diversity and inclusion strategy that came out at the end of October. That strategy moves on from our three year strategy from 2018 to 20. 21, which was called In Pursuit of Progress. I would encourage you all to read A Game for All because that really does guide us for the next three years on what the FA is looking to achieve across all aspects of the game when we are looking at equality, diversity and inclusion and anti-discrimination. We also have, of course, our Inspiring Positive Change strategy, which is our Women and Girls strategy. We have the Survive, Revive, Thrive strategy, which is our grassroots strategy. And we have the recently announced Football Your Way our recent disability strategy, which also came out in recent weeks. So the Football Leadership Diversity Code and its background. Well, the Leadership Diversity Code really has been developed in collaboration with club leaders, community football representatives, county FA executives, and others across the game to ensure English football at all levels better represents our modern and diverse society. Recognising that off the pitch club administration and support structures do not currently reflect the increasing diversity that we see on the pitch, the code will increase accountability and transparency. Its aim is for clubs across the non-elite game to commit to being leaders in football diversity, ensuring they promote and deliver the high standards of in inclusion across their clubs. The expansion into the wider football pyramid really marks one year since the launch of the Football Diversity Code for the professional game just over a year ago. The code covers a number of key areas, four key areas that you can see there, one being leadership and making sure that those in decision-making roles and those that are um, leading clubs are diverse, that that group of individuals are you know, representative of the, 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 the society that they serve and their local demographics. There is a second section on culture, which is all about how we drive a culture of allyship, how we drive a culture of equality, diversity, and we also make people feel as included as possible. There is a section on coaching roles, and that is how you ensure that your coaching um, positions and the people that are fulfilling your coaching positions are reflective of the player base that they may be serving. And then, of course, there is the the focus on reporting discrimination that is something that we would never um, look to um, do less of we want to ensure that everybody across in and around a club is completely up to speed with what it means to report discrimination how you go about reporting discrimination and ensuring that when you see hear experience discrimination in any way you do report it and you know exactly how to do that the code does cover um, certain protected characteristics such as race, sex and disability and primarily those from historically underrepresented groups from ethnic communities and also from a gender perspective. So while the code does look at all protected characteristics, there is a primary focus on ethnicity, gender and disability. We will look at how we annually collate the data um, and how we report that. Um, of course, the code is not target driven for the NLS for the women's pyramid and for grassroots football, but we will look at how we do reporting over a longer period of time. 
And as you all know, the code is also part of the minimum criteria for England football accredited clubs and leagues. So if a club wants to achieve England football accreditation, one of the requirements is to sign up and adopt the Football Leadership Diversity Code. Steps one to four clubs have the option to follow either the professional version of the Football Leadership Diversity Code, or they can look at this particular version that we're taking you through today. Um, really, it is entirely up to the clubs in terms of whether they feel they can adhere to some of the uh, numerical targets that appear in the professional code versus the non-numerical targets um, that appear in this version of the code. Um, that is a, a choice that National League system clubs can make depending on where they sit in the pyramid. For clubs in the grassroots um, space, of course, you have your local county affairs to lean on for support um, as well as leagues where you need to. So just in terms of understanding the code across the game, as you can see, for grassroots clubs signing up to the code, we really want to ensure that there is a serious intent to embrace diversity. So the professional diversity code really does sit at the top of the pyramid. And as you can see, as we move into step two and below, kind of step three onwards, you can see that the number of volunteers then significantly shifts. And of course, you know, we, we are aware that um, many volunteers run a lot of our national league system clubs, a lot of our grassroots clubs, you know, et cetera. And so that is where this code then kicks in. Uh, and of course, this code is not um, target driven, as I've said. So in terms of the Football Leadership Diversity Code in the professional game, that was launched in 2020. Over 50 clubs have signed up to that professional code so far. And of course, that code, as I've said, includes targets for signatories for, for senior leadership, for coaches and other roles um, for both ethnicity and wider diversity. There is, of course, a central recruitment portal available for clubs to also ensure that they are posting jobs and that it's very transparent which jobs are available. That is also the case for the grassroots version of the code, the National League system of the code that we are talking about today. To learn more about the professional code, you can, of course, look at fa.com um, at the FLDC careers page um, and the FLDC webpage, and you can learn more about how the professional version of this code has evolved over the last year. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Aaron, to talk to you further about why we need to focus on equality, diversity, inclusion, and what that really means for us. But from a point of view of wider society and football in particular, why do we need to focus on this? And I think I'll start with two of the, the two green boxes at the bottom of this slide that covers off. You know, if we look at disability football teams, they've grown sixfold uh, in the past 10 years. And if you look at women's and girls playing football, the population has grown uh, doubled in the last three years. And for us, diversity in football requires attention. And that across all of these areas, the, if we have diversity within them, it brings ideas, it brings new perspectives, it allows for cognitive diversity and constructive debate, it allows for improved output and decision-making, because actually people bring not only professional outlooks, but personal perspectives and lived experience. And as part of this, actually, what, one of the things that we're hoping to achieve is that, that we provide you with an opportunity to access more talent, to access more diverse backgrounds, and be able to make those decisions to meet the needs of, of the changing face of football and of society as well. And when we've done uh, some looking into some research around what diversity in sport can lead to, if you can provide service and, and level of coverage for diverse communities, what you will find is within those communities, sport is intrinsically linked to um, health benefits and fit, uh, physical and mental health and well-being. And also, actually, those communities, as I've said, provide back to you services that meet the needs of the communities that you will serve. So starting with the demographics of the UK, and I think it's worth saying that um, in the next year or so, we should be seeing the most recent census data populated to us. You'll see there very clearly that the number of historically underrepresented ethnic communities has grown in the UK, almost a, a doubling of the pop Asian population, a 50% increase in the black population, and near double of the mixed population of Britain. And across all of that, of course, football is intrinsically linked into what. Um, 
into into from from this into society. So society, what happens in society will come down into football. And what we would like to think is that by doing this and adopting the FLDC, we'll be able to you'll be able to meet the needs of those communities. But it won't be alone. What we'll do is also provide you with the long list of pieces of, of information on there. So everything from the promotional resources for your clubs, some social media assets to put out online as well to draw more people in, a number of templates uh, to recruit, uh, support your recruitment, a jobs board for you to share vacancies that may, for some of you that may be paid, but also for volunteer opportunities. I think it, it's always uh, worth saying that the sheer number of hours and time and resource that volunteers give up for grassroots football, the National League system and the women, women's pyramid will never cease to amaze me. Guidance uh, on monitoring club diversity. Again, we appreciate you're not, um, some, some people aren't experts in this area and that support can really help them. A template on a club equality policy to make sure that the club meets all the needs and the criteria is set out. Training available that is uh, specific to diversity and trackable through your fan number, so it's registered against you. And a template for an annual internal club survey, so you can really get to understand what are the people at your club thinking, what do they value, and how can you work with them upon that, whether it's both from a development point of view or a positive point of view. And lastly, but no means leastly, uh, reporting resources and videos to for you to share to make sure that you know if there is. Uh, any acts of discrimination, whether it be internal or external, you can support the people who are the victims of that in reporting that to ourselves. So there was one provided for the um, professional game. And within this, you'll see also one provided for the grassroots game as well. And within that, you'll be able to look at job type. You'll be able to filter by whether it's paid or voluntary. You'll be able to look at the location of it. And hopefully what we can see here is a centralized portal where you can, um, whether you are somebody advertising or whether you are somebody looking for an opportunity, an opportunity of experience or an opportunity to maybe change career and move into football, this will all be available for you through the grassroots um, leadership code pay, uh, jobs board and similarly through the, through the professional game one as well as the professional element of the clubs. Okay, what you can see here is uh, an overview of the Football Leadership Diversity Code. This is what you would see in my portal um, under the Platform for Football System. In order for clubs to adopt the code, of course, you need to open up the code in uh, the PFF platform and then download the version of the code that exists there, which is what this looks like, and then hit the Adopt button in order to log that the club has now signed up to the Football Leadership Diversity Code. As you can see, and I mentioned right at the beginning, there are five key sections of the code itself. There are no targets in there. It's not numerical. There are no percentages to, to reach or any quotas or anything like that. This is really about committing to being football, uh, football leaders, um, to being leaders in diversity in football, ensuring that you promote uh, and deliver the high standards across your club. So in summary, as you can see, there are five sections, one around club leadership. And club leadership really does mean clubs, committees, or anyone who makes day-to-day -day decisions concerning the running of the club itself. So there's some of the things that you can see on there includes ensuring that your leadership reflects the local population in terms of gender, ethnicity, disability, and other historically underrepresented communities, that you are ensuring the equality of opportunity for all, that you are carrying out selection based on merit only uh, while seeking to source volunteers from a diverse pool of talent. The coaching selection, coaching and selection um, number two section is really about how you commit to ensuring diversity within your volunteer coaching workforce. That's making sure you support individuals from historically underrepresented groups, that you select coaches openly um, and encourage those from, diver from a diverse range of backgrounds to coach within the club really want coaches to reflect the player base. The third area is around culture. So that's making sure you have a club equality policy in place, which promotes ED&I, ED that you are ensuring that all your club officials attend the FA's equality and diversity online offerings, trainings, refreshers, etc. that you are signposting all of your members to the FA's equality, diversity and inclusion online trainings, 
um, and that you're just monitoring the cultural progress um, through the annual club survey that the FA will be providing. The fourth section on reporting discrimination is really about encouraging the reporting of discrimination. And how do we do this? Well, we will continue to distribute information on how you report discrimination, um, whether you are a, you know, a club representative, whether you're a player. We want all club members um, to ensure that they know exactly how to report discrimination. We want to also, you know, acknowledge that um, clubs in some instances uh, will also need to contact their local police, uh, will need to log a report uh, with their local police, but also to report incidences through their county FA um, and, of course, through the Kick It Out and through the FA. And there are, you know, many ways in which uh, discrimination can be reported and all of that information is, is available through the code. And then finally, just raising awareness. You know, we want clubs to use the FA's diversity code, all the resources that are available um, to really try and raise awareness within your club environment to ensure that every person, whether it's a child, adult, parent that comes through the club is feeling part of the club and that they feel included. You know, the inclusion piece is really important. We'll come on to that later. If a club is looking to understand their local demographics, then each club can receive a breakdown of local diversity data from their local county FA for comparison purposes. So any club that is really interested in understanding what does the diversity in my region really look like, you are able to contact your, your county FA and they can give you that information based on some of the reporting tools and data that we have available. So as I mentioned, this is what um, the access to the code looks like within the club portal. Um, there is a section called documentation. As you can see highlighted there, there are a number of FA policy templates that sit in this space. The Football Leadership Diversity Code, the FA Safeguarding um, Children's Policy. You can see the FA Safeguarding Children's Policy for adults uh, with adult teams with under 18 players. And of course, the FA's Equality Policy. What you need to do is if you are a club representative or somebody from the club that has access to this particular system for your club, then you can hit the adopt button and that will give you a download of the code itself and then give you access to all of the, the various um, points of information that will help you on your FLDC journey. First and foremost, with the Equality Act, and that's an act of parliament that were brought together various anti-discrimination acts and regulations in the UK. So if, in effect, it is law that legally protects anyone from discrimination in the workplace and in wider society. You'll be able to see in the green box at the bottom there a definition from the Equality Act of what discrimination is. Um, and within that, within the Equality Act, there are nine protected characteristics. So they are race, disability, age, um, gender reassignment, religion of belief, sex, sexual orientation, marriage and civil partnership, and pregnancy and maternity. Now, go back to what we mentioned earlier when we were talking about uh, society in general. I think, again, when we look at things like discrimination in society and hate crime as it's termed by the police, so in England and Wales, you'll see on the right there that in 2011 and 2012, um, which is the reporting period they hold, the number of cases for of hate crime for race, for example, versus the number of reported hate crimes between 2019 and 2020 um, rose 130%. The same for religion, rose to 374% in terms of the number of reported hate crimes in 1920 versus 1112. And again, you can see there that actually the number of hate crimes over that decade that are reported uh, to the police have increased dramatically. What that means is football is reflective of society. And as such, you'll see there uh, on the right hand side is and appreciating, you know, last season was curtailed on a number of occasions due to COVID. On the right hand side is the statistics for the number of discrimination reports received in football during the season 2020-21. And as of a few weeks ago, early November, on the left hand side is the cases um, that have been reported for discrimination in football. They are broken down, as you can see, and race colour ethnicity is defined within our rules and regulations, the E32, which is a, an aggravated breach, um, shows that race, colour and ethnicity mile uh, significantly above many of the other uh, characteristics that are reported against. But nonetheless, there are increases virtually across every single area.
Now, on slight changes, how can this sometimes manifest itself, but not necessarily in the most overt way? It can look at things, we look at bias and stereotypes, or specifically unconscious bias. And unconscious bias, I know we said we wouldn't almost lecture with this, so if you want to go away and read, read up on some of these pieces, I think that would be a fantastic starting point. But a very brief intro to them um, is that actually with an unconscious bias, you can be influenced around uh, almost how stereotypes look to you. So you can be influenced around gender and sexual orientation, race, uh, disability or social background. And it, we make so many judgments on a day-to-day -day basis based on the sheer amount of information we have that actually we, we can make uh, biased decisions even without thinking about them, we can, which is therefore unconscious bias. Um, we all hold them, but actually it's been about being aware of them. So have a think about that as you, as you go away from here. And similarly, stereotypes, which, you know, as it says there, is an overgeneralized belief or assumption about a particular group of people. And it may or may not be true, but these assumptions can often lead to othering and exclusions of groups, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. And here we are. So what we want to do is present to you a couple of case studies that we've um, identified across the Women's Pyramid, the National League system and grassroots football. So first and foremost, we've got Mike Pierre on from Ammonia Youth, who's going to talk to you about his football club and why the FLDC is important to them. Mike, if you're on. So, Mike, if you could just tell us a bit about Ammonia um, yep. and also about why the FLDC is important to yourselves. Okay, just, just a brief introduction. I mean, um, the, the, the club's um, been going since 1994 and um, was, um, uh, as a club, there's a little bit of history behind that. 1974, um, as a, 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 because of a migrants from Cyprus came, you know, came over and um, they wanted to stay in their communities Wanted to be wanted to play football in amongst the communities in one of the first community clubs, Ammonia London. So when when the original founders of Ammonia London, who are, are still going, um, they got got a bit older, um, knees started going and started to have children. They wanted um, their children to be um, to play football, so they founded Ammonia Youth, which is a separate club, even though it um, it has the same name. So in terms in terms of why inclusion, diversity, community. And, um, you know, everything that we're talking about is important to the club is that it's actually born out of that. It's born out of being a, a, a minority. Um, while it's not exclusively Cypriot, we don't just have Cypriot children playing. Um, it, that it has got that background. And what we've done in the last few years specifically, I, I think, is, um, uh, is the explosion in girls football. Um, and again, a really good story on that. I mean, I was on my way to um, one of the Euros um, several years ago, one of European Championships, and I and, I'm, and I met a friend who used to do so. You know, he's goalkeeper in the community. You know, played in there, and he said, "Look, Mike, I've got, um, I've got a daughter, and she's really into football. How can I? You know, where can I find a club for her? I know you're involved with Omonia. and I said, "George, just set it up," and he did. And I think six years, six or so years later, they're now under 18s. We've now got six girls clubs, uh, six girls team, should I say? Over um, over eighty girls, you know, playing and training training football every week. We've got um, you know women coaches as well. We've got women on our um, on our committee. So for us, the journey where originally it was like an old boys network, I, I guess you can say, you know, the, the traditional football club. It's now evolved, and um, yes, it's, it's been great. And something like this, I think, is really important for all clubs to embrace because if we look at our separate community where our uh, where our history starts, but also just looking at our community now, it, it's really important to embrace that diversity and to and, and to make sure that we do mirror the, the community that we exist in. And you know, the photo you got in front of you, I mean, look at that. There's boys, there's girls, there's diff there's different ethnicities there, and, and amongst the coaches as well. So um, very definitely for grassroots, this is something that we we fully embrace, we we'll fully get behind. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Mike. And I want to say congratulations as well. One of the first um, clubs I sort of came across when I joined the FA um, as we were supporting the FA Grassroots um, Awards. And they were up for the nomination for the Club of the Year 2021 and subsequently won it. And I just really want to say congratulations for that as well, Mike. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. So I hope that's inspired you to start off with. The next club we're going to have a look at uh, is Chapel Town Juniors and Farsley Celtic. Now, Chapel Town is located in one of the most ethnically diverse parts of Leeds, where 
65%, uh, oh, sorry, over 65% of the population are uh, from a historically underrepresented ethnic background. Within this, they linked up with step two on the National League system called Farsley Celtic and provided opportunities for the people of that uh, grassroots football club to be able to play at such a high level within the pyramid. And actually, most recently, a number of players have been able to move into the professional game. Akil Francis and Reggie Ward are two that stand out, one who has had a trial with um, within the Football League at the club and one who is now playing professionally in Scotland. The next club that we'll look at is Lewis FC, who are the first and only gender equal club in the world. And I got to speak to Karen Dobris, who is one of the directors about this. So their women's team uh, play a trade at step two in the women's championship and their men's team play at step three in the national league system. And actually, Karen spoke about how during the 16-17 season, there was really a question mark at a board meeting as to why was it that the women's team was progressing really well and yet the men's team still got most of the budget. And this led to the uh, direct question of why. And they went through the ethos of the club, the community ownership, um, the fact that the club is not about creating profits back for private shareholders. And actually, they wanted to really start to address some of the some of the issues that affect them and their communities and ask themselves the question, are we perpetuating the gender pay gap and gender inequality by working on the same budgets as they mentioned above? What they've since done is brought, brought both budgets in, in, in line with each other. So they actually offer equal budgets to both the men's and the women's team. They're a real shining light in that sense. And I would suggest anyone you know, who wants to have a look at Lewis FC to pop onto their Twitter page. It's a fantastic resource to use. The next club we'll look onto is Barton Inclusive FC. And I'm delighted to be joined by Sophie. Um, who is the person who set up Barton Inclusive. And Sophie, again, just a couple of minutes, tell us about Barton Inclusive and why the FLDC is important to you, to you as a club. Brilliant. Thank you, Aaron. Can you hear me okay? Is it all working? Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you've had a brilliant day. Um, it is actually signing out time at college, so I do hope that you can't hear any of the... Um, the noise from outside. So um, yes, my name's Sophie. Um, in 2019, I um, I founded a club called Barst Inclusive Football Club um, with the goal to ensure football was accessible for all within the small town where I live, which is Barton upon Humber um, in Lincolnshire, um, with a focus on players with a disability, additional need, or who suffer from long-term poor mental health. And most importantly, ensuring that the football offer and provision was authentic, it was competitive, and it was true to um, the beautiful game. Um, Barton Inclusive FC's values are respect, teamwork, family, um, inclusion, diversity, and together. Um, these values were decided by our players, um, and our players are truly embedded in the club and involved in every decision-making process that we make. We empower everyone within the club um, to aspire to set their own goals and work collaboratively together um, to achieve their dreams. That's both players and volunteers. Now in November 2021, um, I'm really proud to say that we have over 120 footballers at our club. Our youngest is a five-year-old wildcat and our most experienced player um, is a 78-year-old walking football player. And within this, we also have four teams who play adult and youth football within the disability football framework. However, we do currently have to travel outside of our county to do so. Um, as a club, uh, we recognise that we're unique and specific in terms of the players we engage with. However, we truly believe that football can and should uh, be welcomed to everyone so that they can train, develop and improve the lives um, of all players who have a passion for football, irrespective um, of their disability or experience. Um, what we've achieved at a specific inclusion club, um, I think has been necessary at the moment in time for our community. We genuinely believe that every club um, has the potential to support and engage with um, a network of disability football to ensure that the football offer is reflective um, of their own communities. And this is why we're moving forward um, with a partnership with our local non-league semi-professional football club, which is Barton Town, and, and why I believe um, that the Football Leadership Diversity Code and its expansion to the grassroots game is a significant and important step um, in ensuring that football truly does reflect uh, the modern day society. 
Um, reflecting on our journey, um, we have players that are now officials, players that are now coaches, and players who are now valued committee members. Um, this has impacted on their lives. It's enhanced their employment opportunities and it's contributed to an improved well-being, um, self-esteem and confidence. Um, and without our club, these opportunities wouldn't have been available for these individuals locally. And in turn, um, they wouldn't now be involved within the grassroots game as qualified officials and coaches. Um, and football clubs across the whole of England are central to their community and in some cases, the real heartbeat of their areas. Um, and this is why striving for a more inclusive culture will have a far greater impact than football, as we've seen at Barton Inclusive Football Club. Um, I think the code will help support and guide clubs to truly meet the needs of their communities. And through this, as we've seen with Barton Inclusive Football Club, uh, lives will be changed and people will be empowered through football. And before, before I finish, um, I'd just like to um, read out a quote, actually, from one of our players, which I... I think will probably be more impactful than myself. So uh, this is from one of our players. Uh, before I joined BIFC, I was lost. I had gone through an awful time and hated going outside or socialising. From the moment I met the volunteers and everybody else at the club, I immediately felt part of a family. This football club has helped me become more confident and a lot more outgoing. I've achieved a new role in my employment I didn't think was possible. Everybody at the club is part of a big Family and everyone in our club is part of that, no matter what role you play. Um, so thank you so much for listening and, and allowing me to speak today and I uh, hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Sophie. That was absolutely fantastic. And just, you know, thank you again for, for doing what you do at Barton Inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hope these uh, four case studies that we've provided to you really inspire you to be able to take away from today uh, the, the FLDC grassroots and be able to manifest that within your own club. I'll move on, let Dal take over and have a look at role modelling, inclusive behaviour and allyship. So when exploring role modelling um, and looking at inclusive behaviour and allyship, we want to ensure that every single person in the club is an ally, is role modelling the right behaviours that really does promote inclusion. And what is an ally? Well, an ally is somebody that stands up for everybody, stands up for all people to ensure that people feel valued, and included within the club or league. That is, you know, anyone from different backgrounds, anyone that might have different, different experiences, lived experiences to us. It's how we create connection between us and others. An ally is also somebody that normalizes inclusive language and behaviors and brings the best out of everyone around them, regardless of who they are, regardless of what their characteristics are, um, regardless of whether they are from a different part of town, you know, it makes absolutely no difference. And an ally also focuses on fairness and lets everyone have a voice um, and also actually stops um, others from doing anything differently. You know, and that requires courage. That requires people to continue to shut um, others down that perhaps are not doing the right things, perhaps not giving everyone a voice. Um, you know, we want everyone to feel comfortable. There needs to be a level of confidence when people come into your club. Um, and that's where we're trying to lead to. So, you know, really do ask yourself, question are you an ally within your club or league what do your values look like are you demonstrating the right behaviors and are your actions then you know reinforcing your values and behaviors are you closing down or at least um, encouraging people to do the right things and also discouraging them from doing the wrong things which is you know sometimes can be seen through microaggressions can be seen through you know people not making certain people feel welcome there can be many ways in which this manifests but we do want clubs to really think about how they are role modeling inclusive behavior and demonstrating allyship. So being a positive role model and ally really focuses on four key areas. The first one is around how you showcase inclusive behaviors. You know, that is about personalizing, making sure that you are modeling um, and you're trying to advance inclusion by really modeling authenticity and concern for the well-being of others that you're engaging others in respectful but tough conversations and that you're being aware of unconscious biases and you're listening and valuing other people's viewpoints. You're also experiencing and being aware of cultural context and building teams with diverse thinking. And cultural context could be a whole variety of things. It could be where you live uh, in the local area. Some parts may be different to others. It could be that you belong to a different community. It could be that you're from one of the historically underrepresented communities. You know, really does, it could be from that you're from the, the LGBT community. There are many ways in which we can look at cultural context. 
a positive role model and an ally is also building positive relationships. You know, an effective ally is, has empathy and forms of and forms relationships with people from different backgrounds. They encourage this by promoting networking and mentorship for individuals of different backgrounds and perspectives, and they engage everyone in inclusion-focused activities, regardless of who they are, what their identity is, or what their background is. So really, look for unique opportunities to bring the workforce closer to people from different cultures, experiences, and perspectives. And when we talk about focus on commonalities and not differences, you know, everybody has a multiple level and multiple aspects to their identity, whether that's their gender, whether that's their race, you know, what age they are, their family status, their health status, their unique hobbies and interests. And that's just for starters. So all of these things intersect and overlap in, in many unique ways. So defining individuals by really more than a single identity. You know, we, we are more than one, just one identity. So we don't really want to force people into one box. And it's essential to, to really cultivate allyship on that basis, to enable people from different cultures, experiences, and perspectives to learn about one another and discover how their identities intersect and overlap. And the fourth area around communicating the need to be inclusive as a club uh, and doing that on a regular basis. When allies perceive subtle or indirect bias uh, against others, they really initiate courageous conversations or consider other ways to address bias. Allies really role model inclusive behaviors. They ask questions and they encourage others to do the same. And if they perceive that a statement or an action is not inclusive, allies share solutions that would make the situation more inclusive. They hold people to account on what they're saying and how they are behaving. And where we're getting to is, is as you can see in the, the green boxes, we're moving from purely diversity to inclusion and belonging. Diversity is purely the numbers, you know, the number of uh, different types of people that you might have. You know, it could be really diverse in terms of the number of players that you have and where they're from and the different backgrounds that they have. But are we truly getting the best out of them? Are we creating a, an environment of inclusion and belonging? Do the people that perhaps are from a... Um, a, a community perhaps that is less represented in the community in the local area, do they feel that they are included in what's happening in the club? How do we bring them in? How do we make sure that any community, regardless of who they are, where they're from, are feeling like they can be their true selves within your club environment and that they're confident to be their true selves? And that is where we are moving from the diversity piece to really creating a, a environment of inclusion and belonging. That's really where we need to get to. Okie dokie, that's 27, 28, 29 is also me. Okay, let me carry on with that one. And then 13, 31 is Aaron, then I do the close, okay. 29, okay, let's do that one. I don't know if this is as good as the first time, if I'm honest. Yeah. Okay. All right. So how do you get support? Well, if you are a club in steps three to four, your league is available to answer questions that you may have. Please do reach out to your league. Please do ask questions. Please do consult the FAQs on the FLDC website. If you are a club from steps five and six, and obviously within the grassroots community, your county FA is available to help you. There is a huge useful link section available at the FLDC page, the fa.com forward slash FLDC. That covers a whole load of information on our strategies. It covers uh, all of the strategies that I've talked about today, whether it's the disability strategy, the EDI strategy, the grassroots strategy, the women and girls strategy. There's Sport England guidance in there that helps uh, you to understand um, how you can create inclusive environments. There is guidance on coaching. There's guidance on how you uh, create inclusive environments within a club structure. Uh, lots and lots and lots of information that is on our webpage uh, that any club can access, um, download, and use it uh, to suit you. 
Um, and of course, you can always get in touch with the team as well. So we're at the end of today's opening session. As Aaron has mentioned, there are other sessions that we want you to go into to learn some of the webinars that are happening around coaching, that are happening uh, that cover off recruitment, um, getting the best out of the youth, and also understanding reporting discrimination. Please do sign up to those sessions. They will give you a plethora of knowledge that will help you. So just to recap our session objectives for today, we wanted to ensure that you feel better educated as stakeholders on EDI, uh, on equality, diversity and inclusion, that you understand what the Football Leadership Diversity Code is all about, that you develop your awareness of protected characteristics on EDI understanding overall, and really appreciate the value of difference. And of course, we wanted to talk to you about allyship in football and from and for you to hear from some of our best practice examples and, and case studies that you've heard from the relevant clubs. Really, really interesting to hear what the clubs have to say and how they are utilising the Football Leadership Diversity Code. So thank you from us, from everyone at the FA. Thank you for taking on the Football Leadership Diversity Code. Thank you for being on this journey with us. It is something that we want to continue to push on over the next few years and beyond. And we really do want to change cultures within football. We want everybody who engages in our national game to feel included, to feel that they belong and to really be their true selves. That's really what we're trying to do. Um, and we can only do that by all being focused on the uh, tools that we have at our disposal, such as the Football Leadership Diversity Code and its remit, as well as a lot of the resources that we have available to us to help us on that journey.